Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, earth. or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. You're Lindsay. And I have two long horror stories that I'm very oh. excited about. Okay. Yeah. I was getting creeped out last night. I am ready. But I know that before we get into that, uh, we do have, uh, bear with us, Creeps and Peepers, <laughs> we have a couple more announcements. But but it's an announcement you've heard before. Yeah. So, summer camp. Yes. Okay, that, that's, that's the headline. Woo. In case you're fast forwarding. <laughs> that's <know>. the headline. <laughs> <laughs> okay, summer camp. Okay, by the time you guys hear this episode, huh? tickets for summer camp taking place September uh, 21st, 21st through, the through the 24th. I gotta memorize now. Look at you, Dan. Yeah. Look at you. Uh, if you're listening, well, there's a couple different things that you should know. One, if you're an OG camper, yeah. you should have already gotten your uh, link to the tickets in an email and also in the Facebook group from last year. Don't share that link because that's what gives you easy and early access mm -hmm. to the tickets. Then next up, okay, by the time you guys hear this, mm -hmm. patrons, mm -hmm. you should also have your link to buy tickets early and yeah. that is in a patreon post whether it's yeah. time suck or scared to der, uh wednesday at noon so if you really listen to this first thing wednesday morning that's true wait wait an hour or two good save hold your breath mm -hmm. you can do this and then by friday uh -huh. this friday january 20th 20th Boom. at 12 noon pacific time tickets are open for everyone yes and, and you you yeah. can find those at badmagicmerch.com look for the banner at the top of the page uh and yeah, and then the tickets will be on sale. So if you received a link in an mm -hmm. email or a Patreon post, that link is good for forever. But also, <sighs> if you can't find it and you waited like a ding-a-ling, uh, then you can just go to Bad Magic Merch and click the banner and off you go. Off you go. Off you go. And then you're going to see us in uh, Northeast, I believe. I don't have the map oh, in front boy. of me. Pennsylvania. People get weird about geography. Really weird. I think it's the Poconos. Not everyone agrees. Nope. But it's uh, we're going to be up there. Chad Daniels and I are going to be doing a live stand-up show with Kelsey Cook and more. There's going to be a live scare to death. There's going to be a fun karaoke contest. There's going to be so karate many chops. activities. There's going to be karate chops, a state of the bad magic. There's going to be uh, water fun and boats pulling and laughter <laughs> and modern and laughter. cabins with hot showers and hiking trails. And if you don't come, you should fucking throw yourself in front of a bus or l l enjoy your life. Aggressive. Sorry. I'm very pumped up. Maybe I had too much coffee right before the show. Wow. Okay. I'll, I'll dial it back. Okay. I'll dial it back. Okay. And just a reminder, guys, just uh, if you were at camp last year, you know the vibe is so awesome. Yeah. Everybody's a friend. Nobody's a stranger. So I've been seeing a lot of people like, oh, I'm afraid to travel alone or... I promise you, mm -hmm. once you get there, it is one giant happy family reunion. It is. It's so amazing. Every, It's all, you know, everyone is inclusive. Mm -hmm. there's, cult, cult, cult. There's room for everyone. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can email us. You can look on the Facebook groups. Like, we've got you. We're yeah. looking out for you. We've got a whole new team of people uh, supporting us on this camp. So mm -hmm. things are going to be very smooth and you don't have to yeah. panic and everything's going to be okay. And registration is easier. Everything yep. is smoother than last year. We learned a lot. Mm -hmm. We did the best that we could last year. And now we're just making it even better. Yes, good job. And one more quick announcement, but then- I'm wearing blue pants. You're wearing blue pants, but then <laughs> my stories are bigger to make up for the announcement. Girthier horror stories. Girthier? Mm -hmm. Is that so? Yep. That's so disgusting. <laughs> so you asked for this week's merch announcement. Uh, I did? Some fans did. Oh, okay. Maybe not you, but some fans <laughs> did. Here it is. Official DJ Honey merch oh in store now. Oh my God. Featuring me, DJ Honey. You can now purchase the official The Buzz 93.6 FM <laughs> t-shirt representing Charlotte's number one adult contemporary station. Oh my God. Also, a pretty accurate DJ Honey tea is available. You'll find the coffee mugs uh, we keep in the station break room. Head on over to badmagicmerch.com and check it all out. I usually try to look at the merch before the show. <laughs> Up and now a little Nora Jones. 
<laughs> and I did not look. And so that really caught me off guard. Okay. okay. All right. All right. All right. So now, um, back to what we uh, normally do here. Yeah. Um, okay. Just just five minutes of announcements. It's fine. But you know what? It's five minutes. But then you get to. There's more than ex, an extra five minutes of horror this week. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for yeah. making up for that in the end. Yeah. Yeah. What fan submitted horror do you have? Okay. Actually, who? I am also very excited about my stories. I found a new thing to be afraid of. Oh really? Yes. I'm super this excited. Far in? Yes. Uh, the Pitchel Parry. It's a, a Pakistani. Something or another. Okay. It's a, a good. I don't know like, that one. Um, well, this story comes from Pakistan. Uh, it, the the folklore comes from Asia, South Asia. Uh, so it sounds like it's in a variety of places, a variety of different cultures, but a weird something I had never heard of. Okay. So we'll leave it there. And then my second story, maybe not initially a story that really grabs you as spooky. Yeah. But by the time you get to the end, you are left wondering how it is we're all connected through spirits. I promise you it will make sense. Cool. It's a very cool story. Ichiwawa by the end. <laughs> all right. I like it. I, I like it too. Um, I, I have two big stories today. A lot of horror. Heading back to Japan for the first one. I became fascinated with Hashima Island, this crazy, very <laughs> urban looking ghost town. I heard you showing Kyler last night. Yeah, ghost city, really. It's like a ghost town. Very unique place. And I thought when I came across it, like this place has to be haunted. And so I searched for a juicy horror tale, set there, found one that I'm very excited to share. This one had me all twitchy last night when I was kind of shaping it up. Uh, I kept thinking I was seeing movement in my peripheral vision in the living room. Well. Like some body moving around or something. I kept seeing, I thought, uh, reflections in the window of mm. something around the living room. Maybe the dogs. Maybe ghosts. No, the dogs were in bed with me. Well, no. Penny was up with me for a little while. She stayed up with dad to uh, help on some horror stories because I wa wa walked down with her when I went to bed. She came back up. Oh, after I fell asleep, she uh -huh. used to come up. And then we're going to stay in Asia, but travel all the way to Afghanistan to cover a collection of supposed sightings from some U.S. Marines there. Very intense sightings all taking place at a location once known as Observation Point Post Rock, a.k.a. The Rock. I think from top to bottom, I'm bringing some of the, some of the best supposedly true horror I've brought in a while. I'm going to say okay. that. Um, that's... A mm -hmm. bold statement. Yep. Uh, plenty of time to get all cozied up with your socks while we settle into this first story. First, blue pants. Mm -hmm. Second, oh, I'm double socking. I know that drives you guys crazy, but my feet are freezing. Funny. Llama, nice. La llama, llama, mad at mama. <laughs> uh, so let me set up some history. Okay, let's do it. Uh, Hashima Island is a very small island. Just 16 acres in total. Just over 12 miles by boat from the city of Nagasaki, Japan. And it is one of the most surreal looking islands, really places on earth. Hashima Island was for a time before it was abandoned in 1974, the most densely populated place on earth by a long ways. 5,259 people crammed into just one fortieth of one square mile. If you multiply that out, it would equal 210,360 people in a square mile. And that is three times as dense as the borough of Manhattan. Holy crap. The most urban of, no, of New York City's boroughs. Coal was discovered underneath the island back. It's really underneath the sea back in 1810. And a mine was completed in 1887 with various massive tunnels dug down under the ocean. Uh, once actually connecting to another tiny island nearby. In 1916, Japan's, and they go down like a couple thousand feet. In 1916, Japan's first reinforced concrete building, a seven, a large one, seven floor miner's apartment block was built to accommodate more and more workers. Concrete was specifically used to protect against typhoon destruction. Mm. Over the next 55 years, more buildings were constructed, including massive apartment blocks, a school, kindergarten, hospital, town hall, community center, and building up was the only way to fit everyone. For entertainment, there was a clubhouse, a movie theater, communal bath, swimming pool, rooftop gardens, shops, even a small gambling hall, all built for miners and their families. Okay, sounds fun. Very surreal. The tiny island looked as if a small slice of a massive metropolis was cut out of maybe Tokyo or somewhere and dropped out into the sea. And this tiny island has seen a lot of tragedy. Between 1930 and 1946, forced laborers from China and Korea were forced to work the mine with up to 1,300 people dying in accidents Holy crap. from disease or from literally being worked to death. And then due to petroleum replacing coal in Japan in the 1960s, coal mines began to shut down across the country and eventually Hashima's mines also shut down and the Mitsubishi Corporation, hmm. who had owned the island uh, uh, in, since, since 1890, officially closed the mine in January of 1974. And then the island was cleared of all inhabitants by April 20th. 
And for years, the ghost island, none of the buildings were torn down. Most of the people's possessions or a lot of the people's possessions were just left there. It was off limits to anyone except government employees and Mitsubishi officials. And it's weird. There's like these videos of just so much stuff left. Clothes, shoes, TVs, dishes. It's just like they just got out really fast. Hmm. In 2002, Mitsubishi transferred ownership of the island to the local city government of Nagasaki. Journalists were now able to legally explore the island. And then in 2009, the island was opened up to tourists. And now guides can take visitors to explore this strange, surreal ghost city. And numerous visitors and trespassing ghost hunters have not surprisingly been reporting encounters with the paranormal ever since. And maybe a little bit before based on our encounter tale today. It is said that many of the spirits of those who died working in the mines, particularly the spirits of forced laborers who were never given proper burials, still haunt the island. The following encounter comes from a pair of ghost hunters who claimed, based on their post, to have boated out to the island back in 2005 before it was opened to the public. And for over 18 hours, they would have the island completely to themselves, at least as far as the living are concerned. Time now for the tale of the City of the Dead. Cam and Craig, two brothers from Issaquah, a suburb of Seattle, were weeks away from finishing a four-year contract teaching English as a second language in Nagasaki. They'd love their time in Japan. Nagasaki was a small, beautiful city, is a small, beautiful city, very easy to navigate, and once they'd settled in, they'd taken day and weekend trips all over the country. And they'd also gotten hooked on Japanese horror movies and a culture more accepting of and curious about the spirit world than America. They became fascinated with Hashima Island. They'd floated past it on a boat tour about a year after moving to Japan, and when doing so, Cam was positive in the distance he saw someone in one of the windows of the old apartment buildings. He was so sure he'd seen someone, he asked the tour guide if they were sure that no one lived on the island anymore. The guide laughed, assured him that no one was living on the island. No one was, was visiting the island, or had been for many years. Ever since, Cam couldn't stop thinking about what he'd seen, though. He tried, his brother Craig tried to convince him that he must have seen a trespasser, and maybe he did. While he knew that was a more rational possibility, Cam nevertheless began to think that he might have actually seen a ghost. And he felt a powerful urge to go back and explore the island and try and find it, or maybe see something else like it. But to do that, he'd have to trespass. And he wanted Craig to come with him, so they'd both have to trespass. At first, Craig was 100% opposed to doing that. But he did love an adventure. He didn't care as much about his, as his brother about trying to see a ghost. He was the more skeptical one. Horror movies were cool, but real? Maybe not. But he did think it would be super cool to check out the old massive buildings and explore one of the most surreal ghost towns on Earth. So he let Cam convince him to do uh, this shortly before they were going to return back to the States where they already had jobs lined up. They wouldn't get in that much trouble if they got caught, and in some extreme scenario, uh, if they got stuck in jail for a few days or deported somehow, oh well, they were leaving anyway. So they rented a small boat for the weekend in Nagasaki Bay. The weather was good. The sea was calm, and they'd only have to travel less than 20 miles, all within sight of land, to make it from where they rented the boat to the island. They figured if they tied the boat off somewhere on the southwest side of the island, they should be out of sight of any tour boats, and since almost no one ever ventured onto the island, as long as they stayed out of sight of any tourists boating by, they should be able to sneak around without getting caught. So on a Saturday morning, away they went. By the time they approached Tsushima Island, it was perfect. No one else was around, and they slowly putted over to the far side of the island. They had a lot more trouble than they'd anticipated finding a spot to safely tie their boat off. The entire backside was encased in a giant seawall. Almost the entire island was encircled in a seawall that gave the island the appearance of a battleship, hence the nickname of Battleship Island. Luckily, thanks to some erosion, there was a spot where they were able to hook through some damage to the concrete wall and tie the boat off. And then, while they were nervous about any high waves battering the boat around a bit, they felt good enough to continue. They were a bit worried about the boat being seen when they finally found this place, but at least they'd made it. It was around noon on a Saturday by the time they were walking into the remains of the old city with their overnight packs after using some climbing gear that they had to, uh, where they had to scale the seawall. They'd done enough homework to know that if they wanted to enter the island from the far side, they would basically have to do some extreme rock climbing. Other than a small slip that about gave Cam a heart attack, they'd climb the wall pretty smoothly for two guys with very little experience doing that sort of thing. Once up on the island, the feeling of being on an amazing adventure really started to sink in. Up until that point, they mostly just felt anxious about getting caught. But now they'd done it. They figured they only had to worry about getting spotted until sundown. After that, what were the odds that someone would come looking for their boat? And then the next morning, they promised each other they'd take off shortly after sunrise. 
If they were going to see any ghosts or experience anything else paranormal on the island, it was going to be tonight or never. They decided to head inside to grab something to eat. They were starving. They didn't want to eat outside and risk being spotted by someone in a helicopter, plane, or passing ship, so they quickly walked towards the nearest building. While now you can actually get a tourist map of the island and know what buildings are what, back in 2005, no such map existed, at least not publicly. The building they walked over and into happened to be the old movie theater. It was perfect for lunch, almost no windows, so they could blast light out of their electric lanterns and creepy as hell. So much concrete. They were the first concrete buildings ever built in Japan, so old and crumbling after for so many years now. There was rubble all around them on the island, mixed into patches of greenery where nature was reclaiming the old city with brush and grasses. There was rock outcropping, so much concrete and rock. The little island was basically the tip of a small, rocky mountain rising up from the seafloor. The scenery did not remind Cam and Craig of any other place on Earth. And on top of everything they could see, there were all the old mining tunnels reportedly going as deep as almost 2,000 feet below them. Miles of tunnels. What might be down there? Setting up in the movie theater and eating lunch, Cam and Craig were surprised to find old snack containers, some unopened, old film posters, some employee clothing, even remnants of some old film, and everywhere flakes of eroding concrete, broken glass, scraps of other material. When the island was abandoned, they really exited quickly and left so much behind it was weird. Also thanks to the wind, there always seemed to be some sort of breeze on the island. There were so many unfamiliar noises. The brothers knew they were in for a long, unnerving night, with or without any paranormal activity. And after doing a bit of exploring following their lunch, the brothers now packed up their garbage, put it away in their backpacks, they promised not to add to the mess, and they wandered out of the old movie theater and into what they figured must have been part of an old hospital, way creepier than the movie theater. There were still old surgical tools lying around, and charts and x-rays and smocks and more. Again, they just left so much behind. Cam and Craig talked about what kind of horrors the doctors and surgeons must have encountered on the island, considering that thousands of the island's residents worked in the dangerous mines. Talking about how many people must have died while they were where, where they were exploring started to really get their imaginations going. Leaving the small medical building, they next checked out the old concrete swimming pool for a moment, but worried about being too exposed and being seen, they quickly headed towards the center of the island now, towards so many old and massive apartment buildings, so many stairs. If nothing else, they were really going to get a workout. Some of the apartments felt even eerier than the hospital. For one thing, there was the fear that at any moment, the roof might collapse, the edge of the building might crumble, or the floor beneath you might give way. All scenarios that would likely lead to death. What made the apartments spookier than the other locations, though, was even more stuff left behind in them. Clothes, televisions, dishes, so many other random possessions, including a lot of toys. What a strange place to live as a child, they thought. Craig thought of an ant farm or a crowded aquarium. It must have felt like the human version of that to live there, smashed into a small area with no quick way to get off the island. They'd heard stories before they headed for the island of kids who went years and years without ever leaving the island while they were growing up here. Bam! Cam and Craig jerked their heads around towards what sounded like a large piece of concrete falling. They retraced their steps towards the outside of the building they were in, but couldn't find the cause of the noise. Standing in an entrance to the apartment building, though, Looking across the courtyard, Cam saw something. Look, he shouted and pointed towards an apartment on the third floor, in the window. While Craig tried to find out what he was looking at, it was gone. Damn it. What? What is it? I, I saw some woman over there looking out at us from inside that apartment. She must have just walked out of sight. We are not alone. Yes, we are, Craig told his brother. There was no boat tied off anywhere to the island when we got here, and we haven't ha heard anyone approach since. No, said Cam. No, she wasn't someone doing like some exploring. She looked, he paused. She looked like she lived here, but not in some crazy hermit homeless way. Like, he paused again. She looked like she lived here back when a lot of people lived here. Craig laughed. If that was true, she would look like a crazy hermit because that would mean she'd been living here alone or almost alone for at least 31 years. No, Cam snapped annoyed. No, she looked how someone would look if it was back when a bunch of people lived here. She looked young, healthy, and I don't know. I didn't get to look at her, look at her very long. Cam trailed off as he continued to scan the area he thought he'd seen her in, hoping to find her again. Still looking in that area, half dazed, he started walking across the courtyard. Come on, let's try and find her. <sighs> All right, Craig sighed. I guess this is why we're here. You think she might have been a ghost? Oh, boy. I don't know, maybe. Cam's maybe felt a lot like definitely. 
Craig hated to admit it himself, but uh, even though he hadn't seen anything, even though he was pretty skeptical about ghosts, he was getting a bit creeped out now and was glad it was still light out. He and Cam explored the next building for what must have been an hour, and they didn't see her, didn't see any ghosts, nor any sign of people having recently been in the area. But they did see some creepy shit, like a room with so many dolls in it, easily two dozen, and they seemed staged, maybe set up at one point into little scenes. But then time, the weather, other trespassers messed those scenes up a bit. Or, Craig hated that this thought floated up into his mind, maybe something on the island had been playing with them. The brothers, before leaving the building to explore the other side of the island, grabbed dinner. By the time they were done, they had about two hours now until sunset. They walked past a few more apartment buildings, some too dilapidated to explore, before making it to another one that had some kind of old shop store in the basement. The cash registers were still there. There were still some shelves, old clothes, some canned goods, a lot of chunks of concrete. The sun was setting while they were in this basement when both of them started to feel like someone or something was watching. You feel that? Cam whispered. No, Craig lied. He did feel something. What are you talking about? Something's down here. I can feel it. Something's watching us. I think we're just getting a bit twitchy because after about 30 minutes, it's going to be pitch black on this island. The way those clouds were rolling in, we're not even going to have much moon or starlight tonight. Clank! Both brothers jumped and spun around. It sounded like a can had fallen off a shelf. Bang! They spun the other way. A shelf had fallen down. Bam, bam, bam! They spun around again. Part of a shelf had now detached from the wall and several items slid off of it and crashed down onto the floor. The feeling of being watched now intensified dramatically. They couldn't see anything, but it sure felt like something was in the room with them. Ah! What the fuck? His brother yelled, uh, or Cam screamed. What the fuck? His brother yelled back, angry at being startled and also afraid. It suddenly dawned on him that it would be too dangerous to try and rappel down to the boat in the dark if they wanted to uh, leave before tomorrow. They were too inexperienced to do that safely, and way too inexperienced with boats to confidently get back to the bay at night. If some freaky paranormal shit was going down, they would have to deal with it all night, with no one else around to help them. Did you see that guy? Cam asked. What guy? No. Oh my God. I swear I saw some guy about our age walk out of this basement. Some guy dressed up like a miner, old looking hard hat on his head and everything. Cam looked scared. We're not alone here. But that guy, that, that, that lady from earlier, they're not people like us. I'm positive now I just saw a ghost. Two ghosts. Craig didn't object. He didn't see this guy, but he certainly felt something. And he'd heard all that stuff suddenly start crashing and falling around out of nowhere. He wanted to get out of the basement anywhere but the basement right now. Let's go. Craig started quickly walking towards the stairs that led out of the basement, the same stairs his brother had just seen the miner walk up. He didn't love it, but he loved the thought of spending the night in this basement less. He wanted to snag the last bit of sunlight as fast as he could. Cam was terrified that the ghost would walk back down the stairs at any moment and scare them both to death, but he too had no interest in being stuck all night in this basement, so he followed his brother. Less than a minute later, they were back outside. They felt jumpy and freaked out, but currently at least weren't seeing anything. But then... There! Cam pointed again to the same building from before. They were now just on the other side of it. And this time, Craig saw her too. Holy shit. A young woman. She looked to be around 30. Average looks, plainly dressed, was staring at them from inside an apartment. She stared solemnly. No smile. She looked maybe sad? Irritated? Maybe it was apathy? It was hard to tell what she was feeling. Her expression is hard to describe. And then she turned, walked past the open window, and disappeared. Cam suddenly felt a lot braver than he'd felt a moment ago. I want to set up camp right where we just saw her. What? No fucking way, Cam. We're sleeping outside. No, we're not, said Cam firmly. We came here to try and see some ghosts. And we did just see one. Box checked. I'm done. But what if we could experience something even more intense? You just zipped out of the basement right behind me while there was still some daylight. You're terrified. What are you talking about? I want to see more. This might be the only night in our life to ever experience this kind of stuff. We'll be together. We can handle it. Craig was about to protest when Cam stormed off towards the apartment building. He knew his brother well enough to know he had just made up his mind. He could be pissed at him later when they were away from this damn island. Right now, he didn't want to be alone, so along he went. The two made it to where they'd seen the lady just as it became completely dark out. Luckily, at least Craig thought it was lucky, they hadn't seen the woman again or anyone else. They set up their electric lanterns and used the light to pitch their two-man tent and roll out their sleeping bags. And now Cam wanted to explore the building. No, Craig protested. Fuck you, Cam. Absolutely not. Being in this building is bad enough. 
Let's stay in the tent. If we hear something and you want to peek your head out, go for it. But at least I can bury myself in my sleeping bag until morning. Skeptic is a believer now, huh? Craig paused. Yes, I believe. Happy? I'm also scared shitless. This is not fun. No, Cam agreed. Not exactly. But also so cool in a way. We just saw a dead person who wasn't quite dead somehow. I saw two dead people. They looked at us. Proof of something happening when we die other than just being worm food. Yeah, pretty amazing, actually, agreed Craig. But since we already got that proof, I just want to try and go to sleep and wake up when it's sunny and get the hell away from this place. And then we can talk about it all. Thump, 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 thump. Oh my God, Cam said, whipping around his flashlight. That sounded like someone running down the hall. That's it, Craig exclaimed as he entered the tent. I am not coming back out until morning. Okay, I get it. I'll be right back. I'm just going to look around a bit and then I'll probably come screaming back down the hall and I'll zip myself up for the night and you can make fun of me. Be careful, Cam, said Craig in a serious tone. Cam nodded and then turned to go explore a bit as Craig entered the tent, climbed into the sleeping bag and turned off his lantern. And for the next minute or so, he listened to his brother explore. It had been pretty quiet on the island all day. The sea was fairly calm other than the steady crashing of small waves into the seawall, the sound of the occasional passing ship or boat, the breeze moving a bit of debris here and there, and the sounds they made exploring, it had been quiet. But now, it was extra quiet. Oddly quiet. Other than his breathing, which Craig was trying to control and keep hushed, all he could hear was Cam walking around. He could hear every step he took. He could hear him breathing. And then, all that stopped. Completely. Now he heard nothing but his own breathing. And when he held his breath, he heard absolutely nothing. Total silence. He hated it. It was as scary as the ghost he'd seen earlier. Scarier. He thought about her now. Who was she? Why was she still here? As his mind drifted into various possibilities, maybe a tragic death had left her stuck here. Someone had wronged her. And now her spirit looked for revenge, etc. The footsteps began again and Craig relaxed a bit. It sounded like Cam was returning to the tent. The footsteps were steadily headed back towards him. When they got real close, though, Crick felt some panic in his chest rising up into his throat. There was no light. If that was Cam, just walking back, who was now right outside the tent, where was his flashlight? Why wasn't it on? The footsteps now stopped. Cam? What's going on? Nothing. Cam! What are you doing? Still nothing. The footsteps picked up again. Thump, 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 thump. Cam or someone was walking around the tent towards where Craig was laying down. He grabbed his flashlight, flipped it on. He pointed towards the sound but could see nothing through the tent wall. Cam, what the fuck, man? You're freaking me out. Stop messing around and get in here. The footsteps quickened. Thump, 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 thump. Something to walk back around to the front of the tent. And now, zzzz, the zipper was being unzipped from the bottom. Dear God, he couldn't breathe. His chest felt so tight. Craig trained his flashlight on it, watched the zipper move up, and then suddenly it ripped up to the top and the flaps opened. Ah! It was the woman from before. Her head was in the tent now, and there was something wrong with her eyes, too big, too dark, and her head was approaching him, but her body was not coming inside. It was like her neck was stretching out, stretching out like a snake. And now she screamed too as she faced, as her face came within inches of Craig's, and then darkness. He passed out from fear. He woke with a start the next morning. He was still alone in the tent. Thank <gasps> God it was light out. He saw the tent was still open. He hated seeing this. He knew it meant last night really happened. Where was Cam? Craig practically jumped out of his sleeping bag and started to run down the hall and then abruptly stopped. Cam was sitting with his back against the wall, staring straight ahead, not staring at his brother, staring off into the distance like no one was around him. Craig was unable to snap him out of this state. He was able to get his seemingly catatonic brother to stand up and put on his backpack and walk out of the building. Unbelievably, Cam was even able, with a lot of help from Craig, rappel down into the boat, which thankfully hadn't gotten all beaten up in the night. They both got down into the boat. Cam said nothing the entire time, just kept staring off into the distance. He got into a harness Craig made and let his bigger brother, thank God he only weighed about 140 pounds, lower him down. He put on a life jacket with Craig's help, sat where Craig told him to sit, said nothing. Never looked at Craig. But right after Craig backed the boat out, Cam suddenly turned his head to look at something else. On another seat in the boat, there sat a single miner's hard hat and a woman's dress. Craig flashed on the miner. His brother said he saw in the basement he recognized the dress from the woman who terrified him. Cam started to cry. 
He cried the whole way back to the bay. Craig got him home that afternoon and Cam slept most of the weekend. By Monday, Craig called in sick for his brother for work. Cam was able to start to talk a bit, though. By the end of the week, he was more or less himself, but he refused to talk about what happened to him in the hall that night. He's never talked about it. Craig doesn't think he ever will. Craig has no idea what any of this means other than he and his brother were fools to go to Hashima Island alone that night, an island city of ghosts. Oh no, his poor brother. Fucked him up. Yeah, that's why I tell you, we don't want to see anything. It's not worth it. Yeah, that's no. not worth it. Mm -mm. Uh -uh. That, that intensive an experience, if mm -mm. that really happened, well, it just like, mess you up for the rest of your life? I don't think that you get to control what kind of experience you right. get either. So it's like to put yourself, I was actually cracking up when they were fighting. I'm like, oh, this is exactly the fight that we would have. You would be <sighs> so excited to see something and I would be like, no, 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 no. You stay right here with me. Right, right. And off you would go and then I would find you rocking in a corner somewhere <laughs> and I can't lift you so it doesn't work. I'm, surpri I'm surprised that Craig didn't end up just uh, catatonic well, if he saw what he saw thing. in that tent. Ah. Hey. Uh, I have some pictures. Okay. Uh, this first one, a cool aerial shot of Ashima Island. Oh my God. Isn't that amazing? That is insane. Mm-hmm. It's so surreal looking. It is. These I, it's like I, It's almost like my brain can't process it. Like what? Yeah, they reinforced, obviously, the edge of the island. Uh, that's why they call it Battleship Island, because the way it looks with these this huge, very tall seawalls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, uh, you know, if there was like a rising tide, it wouldn't like batter and erode the island. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, you know, the way it's built on like this, like I said, kind of like a little mountain coming out of the sea. Uh, they just built all these big buildings around it. And I have more pictures. This next one, you can see some of the buildings a little better. Another aerial shot, but from the other side. That's fucking wild. <laughs> this is such a weird looking place. I can't believe it's real. And so much stuff was left was left in this place. Like, I wonder why. Yeah, I know. I don't understand it. This next picture, an old TV, desk, chair, etc. inside what was somebody's apartment. Yeah. And it was so crowded. I watched. I ended up watching some mini docs on this place because I got so into it. It was so crowded on this place that um, there wouldn't be room. Like multiple miners would be staying in the same tiny apartment. Yeah. And they would like, like one guy would be sleeping in the closet. Ugh. One guy would have a tiny little mattress, you know, like in the hallway. Like they just were crammed like sardines. Mm. Um, this next picture, this is a doll found in one of the apartments on Hashima Island three years ago by this YouTuber, Steve Ronan. He was doing some exploration in this video and there was all these dolls all over. Uh, this next one, some tourists in front of a courtyard and a worker apartment in the building. Just such a surreal place. Just kind of shows the scale. Yeah. 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 There was just, oh my God. but they had like, you know, a little, a little place, like a little park where they could play games and stuff. They had quite a bit, but in such a confined space. And a lot of the workers, you know, like, yes, there was a ferry that could take, you know, like, if you yeah, needed but, to go, but it didn't, like, it wasn't like a daily thing, like, tourists. There was yeah. industrial ships coming in and out that would, that would get the coal mm -hmm. and, and bring it to, you know, be sold elsewhere. But a lot of the workers, I mean, they would just stay there and not leave the island. That's what they set all that stuff up for them. Them and their families would just stay for months or years without ever leaving this little tiny patch of land. Well. If it was forced labor, that would make sense. Well, those people didn't have their families there. There was like uh, the, the Japanese, and then they brought in forced laborers to do the roughest jobs. Oh, yeah. Those people, a lot of them died, and uh, they were they were given, you know, no kind of perks or benefits. So there was like, there's like stories, you know, that would come out of some people that had like, they loved their childhoods there. Maybe they were poor before. Now they were in a nice little furnished apartment with uh, cool amenities around and a bunch of other kids to play with. What a weird mm -hmm. juxtaposition they, yep. to those other people. And then there'd be yeah, another building that had the forced laborers that were like, yeah, they were uh, hell on earth for them. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. And you can still go visit this place now. Yep. Now you now you can uh, go visit this place. Um, yep, How there, bizarre! There's, there's tours. They set up these little. Actually, you can go Google Maps as if you just if you just Google it. There's this website that they use Google Maps where you can like um, the street view, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you can kind of like virtually walk around through parts of it. Sure. But they've built walkways because like when these people were exploring it before, they're just walking around on rubble. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, pretty dangerous. Now they have elevated walkways that are reinforced with steel, so you can walk above things. And, and have a little like guided tours. I thought you were going to say they have, they have elevators. They don't take you like, <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? So many stairs. Like it's just because of the the rocky terrain. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what's weird too. It's small and not uh, about only about a third of it is flat. But it was because they found coal there. Lots of coal. Hmm. Yep. There was a, a lot of coal in that area and it was underneath the sea floor down there. So they would go like a couple thousand feet down. Just the pressure. And then, oh, and then spiral out, you know, like, so you're, you're down there in these tunnels 
that if it were to bust, it would just be flooded with the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. What a scary job. Oh, hell yeah. Forced or otherwise. Yep. Exactly. Man. Mm hmm. Ugh. Uh, do you have any uh, questions about that story? Or do you I wanna, do not. Want to get away from it? Yes. Uh, you ready to head west from Japan and on over to Afghanistan? I mean, I don't know if that's going to be any better. All right. Bit of historical setup on this story, uh, too, before I get into it. Afghanistan, officially the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Emirate never sounds right, but that's what the internet tells me. Is a landlocked expanse of desert located at the crossroads of South Asia and Central Asia. A breathtakingly beautiful country with thousands of years of culture, history, tragedy, and of course, a lot of war, especially in recent years. And maybe because of all the death associated with the war, a lot of ghosts. Some U.S. soldiers deployed in Afghanistan over the better part of the last two decades reportedly gained firsthand experience with the paranormal there. The following are just a few of the many stories told by American military personnel who've all claimed to encounter entities in the same place in Afghanistan. Observation Post Rock. Observation Post Rock is located a few hundred meters southeast of what was once known as Patrol Base Hassan Abad in Afghanistan's Helmand province before the Taliban reclaimed it. Observation Post Rock was commonly referred to as just the Rock by American and British military personnel who used to serve there. It was chosen by NATO as an outpost due to the height of the mound, which offered an unparalleled vantage point over acres and acres of coveted poppy fields, all that opium below it. Observation Post is not actually a rock, though it resembles one. It's a roughly 30-foot-tall dirt pile, and it's been there for a long, long time. It's seen a lot of fighting and death. Locals say the original structure of the rock dates all the way back to the time of Alexander the Great, over 23 centuries ago. Medieval arrow slits and the remains of a fortified turrets have survived the years on its eastern flank. Another similar structure is visible in the distance to the south, once probably part of a supposed line of forts built at some point in Afghanistan's long history. No one seems to know at which point in history the rock began to be associated with the presence of evil spirits, but for decades now, if not for centuries, some locals have refused to even venture near the rock, fully believing it to be cursed. And now at least some U.S. soldiers who once served there share this belief. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of the rock. All sorts of paranormal activity has been reported at this location in recent years. At night, a large number of people have been reporting the strong sensation of feeling like something on the rock is watching you. Whispering voices are heard. Many have been specifically described as sounding Russian. Additionally, before withdrawing from the area in recent years, soldiers from the U.S., U.K., and elsewhere, and Marines from the U.S., have reported seeing everything from strange lights at night to odd voices heard inside a radio static to feeling highly unusual temperature drops and cold spots at all times of the year, even in the middle of the summer. And creepiest of all, the distinct feeling of breath on your skin, hot breath, accompanied by the belief that someone is standing directly behind you, only to turn around and see no one. According to U.S. Marine Jose Herrera, the rock is definitely a conduit for spirit activity. He told a writer for the New York Times that when he was stationed there back in 2009, he experienced all this firsthand. He saw strange lights at night, heard unsettling voices coming through the static of his radio, and always felt like he was being watched. He also constantly smelled death, saying, The smells were like something was dying. It was really bad at night, and it was like it came in whiffs or gusts. Dutch Perkins, another Marine formerly stationed on the rock, once heard a disembodied voice speaking in Russian while he was on guard duty. He told the New York Times, It was real faint at first, but eventually sounded like someone was standing post with me. Former London Times journalist Tom Coughlin wrote that numerous Marines in the summer of 2009 he interviewed experienced the same things as Jose Herrera and Dutch Perkins. He said, It first seemed like stress-induced hokum, but the more stories he heard, the more he came to believe that something truly is haunting the rock. Some of the Marines who've experienced strange things in the rock have acknowledged the effects of combat on the human mind, but they still believe those effects do not account for what they experienced. They believe fully that something paranormal is at play there. There are just so many stories. One night, an unidentified Marine and his partner were keeping the area secure in the middle of the night. They'd been sitting quietly for hours, growing bored and fighting off sleep, when suddenly about 75 yards away, they saw what appeared to be a tall man approaching the team, or approaching them, sorry. They put on their night vision goggles to see better and assess the threat. At first, the man looked human, but then when he turned his head towards the Marines, his eyes glowed impossibly bright, so much so that their goggles malfunctioned. The Mysterious Universe website posted a statement from the Marine 
Then the thing turned and looked right at me, with eyes so bright my night vision goggles started to burn out, meaning it was so bright it was burning the system, usually done only by really fucking bright shit like the sun. So that freaked me out, and I pulled my NVGs, my night vision goggles, off, and those eyes now look like neon red blood. Blood red and as bright as the sun. So this freaks me out, and I pull my machine gun over and train the thermal optic on it, uh, on, on to it, and those eyes were so hot it started to burn out the optic. Same concept as before, but with heat. But his body was so cold, he stood out from the background, which is really weird. I slowly loaded it, and then the eyes moved like he cocked his head at me, and turned and walked off and was gone. I didn't say a word of this while we were there or to anyone I served with since we've gotten back. In 2015, the Sci-Fi Network produced a Paranormal Witness episode about this exact outpost and gathered more first-hand accounts. Paranormal Witness interviewed four men, three of whom spent 60 days at OP Rock in 2009, one transferring before their 60 days uh, were up directly because of paranormal terror. Corporal Jacob Lena, Corporal Adam Wilson, Lance Corporal Austin Hoyt, and Lance Corporal Damian Zalek. There were a few other Marines with them, and their unit was led by a man named Sergeant Green. Corporal Lena was second in command. They arrived at OP Rock to relieve some British soldiers from their duties, and before leaving, the British soldiers strongly warned them that if they were to dig up anything, put it back, unless they wanted to risk stirring up something they wanted no part of. Clearly, those soldiers had their own paranormal encounters. The Marines also learned that these soldiers had been taking care of a stray dog, which would now become their companion and lookout. It took almost no time for these Marines to begin to experience whatever had been terrorizing the British soldiers. On their very first night, Corporal Lena was stationed on a machine gun post when he started to hear some upsetting sounds coming through the static on his radio. Sounds he described as a crackling, gurgling noise that kept fading in and out. Lena called the main base to ask if they had sent a transmission. They had not. But his radio continued making noises. He turned up the volume to see if he could make out any words. He could clearly hear someone speaking, but the faint voice was not speaking in English. Lena replaced the batteries in the radio, hoped that would fix it. It did not. The disturbing sounds continued and kept him creeped out most of the night. The next day on the rock, these Marines noticed that the British had dug defensive trenches around their observation post, but they were surprisingly shallow, so they decided to dig the trenches deeper. Lena found an engineering stake with Russian lettering on it when they started to do this. Lance Corporal Wilson found a hole in the rock. Further digging revealed pieces of ceramic pots and cups. From the same hole, they pulled out a human femur bone. Feeling superstitious, they decided to put it back in the ground. The femur would not be the only bone they found. As they dug deeper and deeper, they found many human bones. And now they realized why the British soldiers had chosen not to dig their trenches any deeper. And why they warned them about not disturbing anything. They would come to believe that disturbing this resting place led to an increase in the area's paranormal activity. Lance Corporal Austin Hoyt was on guard duty about two weeks uh, afterwards uh, when now he suddenly got the feeling he was being watched. The same night, everyone was woken up by a terrified scream piercing the still night air. They searched the entire camp but found nothing for the first several minutes. But then Hoyt saw a figure running off in the distance, at least he thought he did. When he used thermal imaging equipment, he saw nothing. He assumed his mind had been playing tricks on him. The next morning, he and his fellow Marines searched the area for footprints or some sign that someone was there in the night, but found nothing. When later reflecting on this incident, combined with so many other reported activity, Hoyt would come to believe he had definitely seen a ghost. Another night, around this time, Lance Corporal Zalik was on guard duty when a sudden cold chill passed through him, even though he had just been very hot and sweaty. He then felt warm breath on the side of his face and heard a voice whisper into his ear. Of course, when he turned towards it, he was completely alone, and his paranormal encounter was not over. Soon after feeling that hot breath and hearing a whisper, he heard a crunching sound, as if someone were walking on the rocky ground above him. He thought it might be an enemy soldier, and ran around to catch someone on top of the post, but again, no one was there. Zalek now stood on top of their base, used a thermal scope to survey the area. He saw no one around the rock until his scope did finally actually land on a figure, a man with his fist balled up in a threatening gesture. Zalek almost shot the man but first wanted to take a moment, get confirmation he was in fact an enemy. Before he could make confirmation, the figure vanished. Freaked out, now he sat back down and immediately felt the same cold chill from before come over him. He didn't know what the hell to do next other than feel frustrated that on top of everything he was dealing with during his deployment, now he had to also deal with menacing spirits. Zalek told Lance Corporal Hoyt about what he saw and Hoyt didn't believe him. Not at first. Zolik said, it's a lonely feeling knowing that this place is haunted and you're the only one that sees these things or hears these things. I'd rather take my chances against something I could actually, like, fight against. Zolik requested a transfer after this incident, and the others didn't know what to think. 
They still didn't believe him, but their opinions would soon change. A few days after Zolik left the rock, Lena was on machine, uh, a machine gun post one night when around 1.30 a.m., that dog began barking at something. He used his night vision goggles to look out into the distance and clearly saw the figure of a man standing outside their post. He said it was very unnerving. I felt like this figure was staring right at me and knew I was staring right back at it. Yes, it. Not him. It. He now used his thermal optics to get a better look and saw nothing. So he switched back over to night vision and saw the figure of the man again. The man had moved about 100 meters closer to his position in just a few seconds. Not possible for a real person. Again, when he looked, nothing showed up on thermal optics. He was looking at what seemed to be the figure of a man who could move at an impossible speed and also a man who emitted no heat, like a dead man. Lena now switched to goggles a third time, and before he could look at the figure again, he felt a double tap on his shoulder, the distinct sign that their unit used to indicate when one of them was coming up behind someone. But when he turned around, no one was there. Lena now realized that Zolik had been telling the truth all along. He wasn't sure what to do because he couldn't say that he was seeing ghosts without everyone thinking he was as crazy as he previously thought Zolik was. So he hoped it would happen to a third person and that they'd come forward and then when they did, he could share his story as well. And this is exactly what would happen just a few days later. Now Hoyt was on duty in the middle of the night and a man named Corporal Smith was at a different post nearby when Hoyt started to have experiences he couldn't explain. First, he heard the distinct sound of footsteps behind him. He spun around, saw no one, tried to tell himself it had just been the sound of his own boots on the loose gravel echoing a bit into the night. But then the dog began growling, snarling, staring off into the distance like it saw someone. So now he uses his thermal optics to locate what the dog is growling at, but only can see the dog and some sleeping marines in his unit. He checks in with Corporal Smith, who tells him he hadn't seen anything unusual. Hoyt sits down, tries to shake it all off, but again, hears more crunching footsteps behind him. This seemed to come from no one. He feels like he's going crazy. And he definitely hears someone else, he definitely hears someone else walking around. As he thinks about how this could be possible, he feels someone breathing on his neck, hot breath, but again coming from no one. Now he is sure that a spirit, or more than one spirit, is messing with him. He'll later say, I couldn't see anything. It was like my eyes were just lying to me, because every other sense in my body was saying, nope, there's something here. So now Hoyt believes Zolik's story too. Lena and him both do, and soon afterwards, yet another Marine will join in on their belief. Lance Corporal Wilson was on machine gun duty a different night when he felt a cold chill go through him and heard a voice whispering faintly. The voice spoke several times and sounded Russian. It grew louder and louder with Wilson describing the phenomena as like the person was actually touching me in the ear. Wilson became terrified. Finally, Wilson sat down with Lena and Hoyt, Hoyt and they all talked about what they'd seen and heard. And they agreed that Zolik was right all along. They couldn't come up with any other explanation for what had happened to them than the paranormal. Only Lance Corporal Smith still hadn't experienced anything unusual. He still wasn't buying it. He told them the sun had fried their brains. But he too would experience something unexplainable. Wilson was on duty their last night at the Rock, terrified that he would hear the whispers again. Whispers would, uh, would end up seeming like the least of his worries for a few moments. All of a sudden, he heard machine gun fire right next to his ear. Everyone woke up assuming they were being attacked. They threw on their gear, readied their weapons. Lena came back to check on Wilson, who was in distress because, because of an incredibly loud noise that had gone off right next to his ear. But Lena saw that no rounds had been fired from his gun. Everyone then heard a loud whoosh, as if a rocket had just passed over them. They checked every trench to try and find where the attack was coming from. No one was there, but the sound of phantom gunfire continued. Wilson continued to hear loud gunshots right next to his ear. Suddenly, after a few minutes of complete chaos, everything stopped and was eerily silent. Lance Corporal Smith was furious. They couldn't find whoever tried to kill them. In his frustration, he took off his helmet and threw it down to the ground. But did anyone try to kill them? There was no sign that any bullets or any other projectiles or explosives had touched the rock that night. Were spirits messing with them? Were they hearing a phantom battle? Smith still wouldn't admit belief now in the paranormal, but he definitely seemed rattled by the whole incident and couldn't rationally explain it. Bless you. The next day, all these men were ordered to leave OP Rock. Sadly, some tragedy would soon follow some of them. Shortly, be shortly after they left, Lance Corporal Smith was killed on a secure base by a rogue bullet, and several other men they served with at the Rock died. Lance Corporal Diggs, another Marine in their unit, died in an IED blast. Lance Corporal Parker was killed during a routine patrol. Corporal Lena said, You thought you were done with OP Rock when you left, but in some ways, it wasn't done with you. Per a 2020 New York Times article, the area is now occupied by Taliban insurgents. No word on what they might be hearing, seeing, and feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I was so creeped out by the story because when I was putting together my episode, mm-hmm. I don't want to give too much away because it's a story that I'm sure I will eventually sh- eventually share. Yeah. Uh, but about soldiers. So not so not when you're putting together this episode, but no. another one. Gotcha, yeah, just, just gotcha. like something I was like, ah, on the fence about. Yeah. It's a pretty gnarly story, so I feel a little like on the fence about whether it's appropriate to share. Oh, okay. But the these soldiers are in Afghanistan and one soldier is communicating with uh, uh, like a former Taliban member, whatever. Yeah. And, and basically they're like stuck in this spot together. And he's like, yeah, like tell me like some folklore. Uh, and then whatever he shares with him, whatever the Afghani man stares, shares with the U.S. soldier, it it is not done with him. And it is like a very creepy story. Oof. And it like seems to have infiltrated like an entire group of men. Whoa. Yeah. That is creepy. But it's so similar, similar in that yeah. way. Yeah. Oh, uh, I have just three pictures. Okay. One is a machine gun outpost at Observation Post Rock back in 2009. I mean, there wasn't any like nighttime, you know, it's probably not sure, supposed sure. to take a lot of pictures of this at the time. Uh, no. Uh, a group of Marines relaxing in their living area atop Observation Post Rock, uh, same year. Is this next one? <laughs> I like the guy standing up who's like being <laughs> I know, silly. He's being weird. He's being, yeah, goofing around. Me too. He looks like our niece. That's a face <laughs> yeah, Bernie yeah, makes. Yeah. And then, and then one more picture. Uh, I don't know who Ooh. this was. <laughs> I just wanted you to see something really oh. creepy. Isn't that disturbing? Yeah, what is that? It's a random thumbnail from that Netflix series Haunted, which I like. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to show you something creepier than what I've been able to find uh, associated with the story visually. Isn't that so disturbing? It is. Yeah. All right. Okay, good. <laughs> Ooh, you, you weren't kidding. You had long stories. I know. I know. Wow. All right. Well, hopefully I can wrap it up quick. Oh, no, no. We got, hey, we got, we got time. Uh, <laughs> wow. That was really, really intense. I wonder what's the deal with it, Russians? Like, why? Well, uh, uh, there was more information I didn't, I mean, again, because there's already such longer, uh, longer stories. Yeah. But they, um, it sounded like there had been Russian stationed at that same place. Places had like soldiers from various wars in Afghanistan for so long. Yeah. And there was a, a rumor not totally substantiated that a bunch of bunch of Russian soldiers were captured, a bunch of POWs, and then executed in mass on that same oh. place, or, you know, on the same on the rock, in I, that same place. I kept bumping on that. I was like, "But why? Like, why all these Russians? What's that about?" That was a rumor for some locals that a bunch of you know many years before. I don't have the exact uh, years uh, memorized as far as when there was this war with. Uh, between the Afghanis and the Russians. Mm-hmm. I want to say back in the 70s, maybe. But anyway, uh, long, long kind of series of battles. And at that time, a bunch of guys, yeah, were, you know, captured uh, on the rock. And then instead of, you know, released back to Russia or whatever, taken to a proper POW camp, they just killed them all. Well, that would explain why it would be so haunted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you and, know, death and destruction. Yep. Yep. Exactly. <sighs> Just like being a soldier deployed anywhere has to be so nerve wracking, like especially in oh, active combat, you know. Oh my god! And then just adding that element in, it's like, what the fuck? I know, like the, <laughs> it like seems the one so guy unfair. Zolik said, it does seem unfair that you're worried about this these hostiles, you know, yeah. the, these other people that want to kill you or trying to kill you, and you're, I mean, again, never served, but it's like I'd imagine you'd be so tense, you know, yeah. because of that all the time and dealing with a lot of stress, and then. If you also are dealing with some kind of paranormal activity in the exact same place, it does just seem like Zolik alluded to just as unfair. Uh, yeah, unfair. And you probably just feel like you're going crazy. It, it, totally. Totally. Like, is this real? Is this not real? Mm-hmm. Like, is this, P- is, am I having, am I going through like uh, yeah, PTSD? PTSD, even though I'm still here. So it's not sure. quite PTSD, but just like, my God. Yeah. I just can't imagine adding layer upon layer of fear, stress, anxiety on top of what's already there. Totally. La la la. Okay, who's your friend this week? I got my same friends from last week. Oh, my okay. little uh, s- scream squishy, and then the the dark Layla. They, based on their coloring alone, they're like a little couple. They look very mm-hmm. cute. Oh, d- were they just making out? Yeah. Oh. <gasps> Did they make a baby? What like what would their baby look Wait, like? Be this way. <laughs> what? <laughs> they're making a baby. You said making a baby. Why can't they be face to face? That's the way they like it. Don't you kink shame them? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> How do they do it? Sometimes they do it like this. Uh-huh. And then sometimes they get real creative and they go like this. <laughs> <laughs> what's that what's that position called? Um I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Even. Is this like what's it called? It's, like rub a dub dub? Rub a dub. I guess it'd be more like like this. 
It's like a, it's like a, uh, I don't know, 69, but, but not, but like twisted. I don't even know what it is. I don't know what position that would be. I don't even know if it's, you know, they have their own anatomy. They can do things that we can't. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for mm-hmm. that, uh, that little lesson. Yeah. <laughs> You're such a weirdo. <laughs> All right. Well, are you ready to hear about my new kind of terror? Yes. Yes. I I know that you have also said this, but it is so exciting to me when we're this far into the show yeah. to find something new it that is. I've never heard of that was entirely different. Uh, yeah. I think it's so fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to hear it. Yeah. And it, usually when we find something new, it's not generally from a fan. Mm-hmm. It's usually something that you've found. So I'm pretty excited. Before you get into the scares... Because I'm kind of in a weird mood. I just want to share this, what was in my head. Okay. And then I'll be done with it. Okay. I so badly, I know this wouldn't even be possible, but I wanted to throw this Layla at your forehead. Okay. Really hard. Okay. Wouldn't hurt you because it's soft. Sure. And then in my mind, I would be able to like a trick shot. I would be able to throw it, bounce it off your forehead, and then catch it right back into my hand and just go right back to it sitting here. Do you want to try? No, I don't want to try because I'd have to throw it too hard. No, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. Okay. I don't want to feel bad. It, it just works in my mind. Where I just, and then a bing bounces off your head and I. Grab it, and I'm back into story mode. I like your sound effects. Thanks. Bing. And then, I know, I know, I feel like people are probably listening to their headphones and being like, don't make that snap again. I know, when I did it, I'm like, oh, sorry. 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 (laughs) But then I thought about our cab driver, Angelo. Oh, man. Once upon a time, Dan Dan and I, we should tell that story on uh, the bonus episode. We should. It's a great story. That maniac. Psychopath. All right. Anyways, (laughs) are you ready for some horror? I am. All right. Let's dive right in. This this email, this story submission is from so long ago, which I love like still like digging into like back catalog. Yeah. So I just pick it random and you'll know that immediately by the reference that they make to a previous episode. Okay. Hey, Dan and Lindsay, loved your last episode, The Lemp Family Haunting. Oh yeah, ways back. Mm-hmm. And particularly your retelling of the Jinn story from Oman. Mm-hmm. As a Pakistani Muslim living in Canada, okay. who, who is always interested in the supernatural lore of other cultures, I greatly appreciate your thoughtful and respectful presentation of jinn mythology. I especially appreciate your recognition that jinn and Islamic theology are not necessarily evil, as non-Muslims and even Muslims tend to overlook, but can Mm. choose to be malevolent to torment human beings. The discussion around whether people see supernatural phenomena through their cultural or religious lenses reminded me of a family story members used to tell me uh, uh, in Pakistan, the legend of the Pitchel Perry. Pitchel Perry are meant to be female supernatural beings, somewhat similar to wraiths or vampires in Western culture, often seen as beautiful women wandering lonely uh, along back uh, back roads These creatures generally look human, save for one characteristic, their feet are twisted backwards. The name Pitchel Perry is derived from the term for backwards feet. Okay, okay. Okay. When I was a child, my cousin spoke of a real Pitchel Perry encounter my maternal grandfather experienced as a young man. As a young doctor, he would often drive outside of the city of Lahore in what is now Pakistan during much needed, doing much needed medical work in a relatively poor, isolated area in the region. One night, he drove home in a very dark, very empty back road when a woman came out of the dark from the side of the road directly in front of him. The woman looked young and attractive, but also pale and expressionless, with extremely dark eyes and unkempt hair, all visible in his car's headlights. Lone women did not typically spend any amount of time in the dead of night in this time and place unless something was very wrong. Being a naturally kind person, he put down his window to ask what was wrong and if she needed any help. In a low but clear voice, she said she was lost and needed to go back to the city center. Worried that someone may have committed some terrible deed against her, he agreed to take her in hope of trying to surmise what exactly had happened. Without hesitation, the young woman came around to enter his car, sitting down in the driver's side directly behind my grandfather. Okay. As he drove back to the city, he tried to make small talk to ascertain where the woman was from, what her name was, and whether she had any family in the city. She said nothing to my grandfather, and he could see from his rearview mirror that the woman was completely still and would only stare directly at him through the mirror, knowing that he was looking at her. At first, he thought the young woman was traumatized, but as the minutes went on, he became increasingly uncomfortable for reasons he couldn't figure out. Something was simply not right about the situation. After moments of strange stillness, the woman started to move her arm to lock the car door on her side. Her movements were slow, 
odd and strangely theatrical, almost as if she wanted my grandfather to know what she was doing, and almost, as he would remember later, as if she wanted him to know she was slowly trying to trap him inside the car. A bewildering sense of panic set fire to his heart. Rather than drive faster, the car slowed as his foot came off the accelerator, almost as if he had no energy left to even press down on the pedal. He watched the woman even more closely, barely looking at the road. The woman's face, previously passive and unmoving, broke out into a chilling grin as her other arm stretched out to the other car door. When I write stretched, I mean that quite literally. With her body otherwise unmoving, her arm elongated to more than twice its length as if made of elastic rather than flesh and bone, stretching in a way that was clearly inhuman. Closing his eyes, my grandfather slammed his foot on the brake, opened the door, and ran out of the car. Refusing to look back, he ran as fast as he could, running into the sparse woods on the side of the road until he was exhausted. It was only after it was only a few hours after into the early morning that he mustered enough courage to go back to his car. The woman wasn't there, of course, only his car in the middle of the road. The car's engine had been shut off, the keys still in the ignition, and strangely, all four doors were locked from the inside, as if the woman had pressed down all the locks and simply vanished. Terrified by the ordeal, my grandfather had to wait until a passerby could help him get back into the car by breaking the driver's side window for a lack of a better alternative. He told this story to his children decades after it happened, a story that trickled down to the next generation and eventually to me and my older cousins. As my grandfather recounted, his medical duties working late in the outskirts of town often left him exhausted. For years, he assumed that that night was the result of tiredness and stress, with his memories clouded by an unknown and purely irrational trauma. It was only after a psychiatrist colleague of his, years later, when his when hypnosis was introduced to medical practitioners in the country, that he performed the procedure on him to help him remember the story in its entirety. The narrative he recounted was exactly as I've described, with two additional details coming to the fore that my grandfather had blocked out. First, the woman's eyes he saw staring at him through that ride were completely black, with even the whites clouded over as if by ink. Those black eyes held him briefly until the very end of the ride, in a sort of trance, powerful enough to make him ignore her second unworldly trait, that her bare feet were blem blemishless pale as her face and twisted completely backwards away as if knocked back from the front of her body by a sledgehammer. Naturally, as I got older, I became more skeptical of this story, thinking it was just one of those legends. Older cousins tell younger ones to scare them. It was only until later that I realized the story of the Pit Pitchell Perry was common mm -hmm. in the Indian subcontinent, subcontinent with legends coming up all over the region. Sometimes these stories are conflated with general stories of jinns haunting rural areas. The story even makes one think of similar tales in the West of female hitchhikers taking rides with men only to disappear without a trace, or even of black-eyed children trying to force their way into houses and cars. Whether any of these stories are real or fabrication, it's interesting to me how the solitary, supernatural female traveler with clouded black eyes seems to be a culturally universal tale, mm -hmm. and your discussion about jinns and shadow people prompted me to share this story with you all. Loving your, your channel and your podcast, which I listen to faithfully every week before going to bed. Mm -hmm. Hoping to hear more Yeesh. stories from you guys soon, particularly some international ones. All the best, side. I can't say it. Saad. How, how is his name spelled? Saad. S A A D. Uh -huh. Pronounced S A. Pronounced saw. Ed. Saad. Oh, like okay. you sawed yeah. a piece mm -hmm. of wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very well structured story, man. I thought so too. Uh huh. And then just the way it was like you know uh, linking like shadow people and black eyed children into the same Pitchell Perry lore. Um, I mean, I you know I am, and I've said this. In the past, I I am always skeptical of hypnosis, uh, just because I you know. I know that like memories can be implanted. That doesn't mean they always are. Mm -hmm. But uh, what, what I got hung up on for a second with this story is I don't the 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 similarity between one of the stories I told about the stretching neck uh -huh. and then the stretching oh, arm. Yeah. I just thought that was so weird because I cannot remember any story in the catalog where somebody. I mean, I'm sure there are, but it's definitely not been for a while that somebody had an appendage stretch out like some. Like, Entity. Go go gadget. Mm -hmm, yeah, like go go gadget. Yeah. And uh <laughs> sorry, I'll explain why I'm laughing in a second. And just so weird to have that show up 
the same episode because we yeah. don't talk about these stories beforehand. Well, and like you were in Afghanistan and now I took us to Pakistan. Oh, like yeah. they're just like weirdly linked. Some weird parallels. Yeah. What are you laughing about? I'm, I'm laughing because Kyler loves to show me um, weird memes. Of course he does. Uh-huh. And, um, and I, I was, both of him and I were like cry laughing last night. Some of the ones he shows me, his sense of humor, like that age, I don't understand what's happening. Yeah. Like it doesn't, but this one. <laughs> Sometimes, basically, the things he shows us just aren't funny. To us, yeah. I mean, to him and his friends, they laugh. I don't, I don't know, do they? <laughs> it's at least funny to Kyler. But Kyler showed me this one. It was like some TikTok uh, Twitter compilation, like a slideshow. I didn't know that TikTok even did slideshows. Uh-huh. And one, so these tweets. And one of the t- <laughs> tweet, or what doesn't matter, but somebody goes, um, what would be your last words if someone was holding a gun to your head? And then the person's response was, um, it was a go go bulletproof head. <laughs> I know it's stupid, but I just picture like somebody holding a gun in your head. What are your last? You got any last words? Go go bulletproof head. <laughs> and all of a sudden, your head becomes bulletproof. It's silly. Oh, okay, it's pretty dumb. Oh, it had to be there. I guess. Okay, yeah, you were cry laughing over that. Yeah, we got really into it. Whew, all right. We were in a, we were in a mode of going through a lot of them though, and yeah. that one got us. Okay, right? okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yes. Yeah. Wow. You know. <laughs> Come on, go go bulletproof head. <laughs> it's it's funny. Yeah, not cry. I, I butchered. I butchered I, it. I don't. I don't know if it's like cry laugh funny, but it's funny. I <laughs> know. <laughs> oh, I I liked also that um, Saad connected other folklore to other folklore. Like I mm-hmm. do love that common connection of like, are there? Because I know we've discussed this. Are there really that many different things, or are there just slight variations on it that go from culture to culture? But it's all kind of the same human ex- yeah. or inhuman experience. And I wonder that too. Like, are the are there these real entities out there so- somehow mm-hmm. in our in our world, or that pop in and out of our world? And then everyone is seeing these things around the world f- from the lens of their cultural perspective. Yeah, and then that shifts it a little bit because reality is funny that way. It is, isn't it? Yeah, I, I do think about that. Where you know, it's it 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 is. It's a little soft on the edges. You mm-hmm. know, you and I could have the same exact experiences, but how your brain processes what just happened mm-hmm. and how mine processes it won't be exactly the same. Correct. And then you know, when you take that, you know, more extreme, like across cultures and stuff, mm-hmm. there could be some entity out there that always looks the same. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, in a sense, like its reality is that it always looks like X. Mm-hmm. But person from culture Y seeing it is going to have it show up a little bit different than person from culture, you know, Z. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and and I like the you know just kind of to touch on what you were saying, like you know, it's we're kind of all the same, all interconnected. Mm-hmm. It's like we all do experience the majority of the same things in life: life, death, tragedy. We all mm-hmm. laugh, we all cry. So it's like we all feel these things. We all live a life. Yeah, and so we're. Theoretically, we're all experiencing the afterlife or what we think is the afterlife or spirits from the afterlife, mm-hmm. but but how it's interpreted and then regurgitated is different. Exactly. We're all we're on the same matrix. Oh no. <laughs> well, on that note, I love this story because it also kind of plays with that idea that like somehow we're all connected. Yeah. And I just I loved this. Like not the scariest story initially, but by the time we get to the end, I love the question that the writer poses just saying like, and I want you to keep this in mind. It's like, what if like by seeing some other spirit, something in the other world, like you yeah. see it and then maybe somebody clear across the country sees the same thing. Yeah. Does that somehow bind you together? Are you somehow connected hmm. not through your own lives, mm-hmm. but through an encounter you have with something in another plane, in another existence, in an, in the afterlife. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that before. I hadn't either, and I think that this is set up so beautifully and is like creepy and weird, but also like, huh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Hello, Lindsay, Dan, and the crew. Hello. <laughs> First off, thanks so much for scared death. My husband was living and working two hours away from home this past ski season, and my nine-year-old twins and I drove most weekends to see him. Wow. Northern Colorado's Highway 131 was our route, a rural area where we'd just see a handful of other cars and rolling hills and pale winter landscapes. Angus cattle pushing aside snow with their noses and bunches <sighs> of deer contemplating crossings. The scared to death back catalog. Uh, held us in good steed on these drives. It's been a fun something to bond over with the kids as they start to leave their young childhood behind and become ready for more sophisticated listening adventures. I've got a story for you. It's a hotel haunting with a twist. I've changed the name of the hotel, but other than that, it is 100% true. 
It starts in Alaska, almost 20 years Mm. ago, on a small adventure cruise I took with family and friends. My now husband, Jeff, was the chief engineer on the boat. He looked so handsome (laughs) in his dress uniform. My best friend orchestrated our first meeting. Oh, chief engineer, she said, can you please give my friend a tour of the engine room? And well, cue the love boat theme song. I was living in Southern California at the time, and Jeff and I did the long distance thing for a while, but a year and a half in, we decided to both move to Seattle to be together. Jeff took a job as a chief engineer at the Hotel Romer, a boutique hotel downtown, all brick and plump upholstery, marble floors that clicked under high heels, a fireplace in the lobby, and wine tastings each evening. Hotel engineers, in case you didn't know, keep the building in shape and solve building-related problems. We rented an old house on Queen Anne Hill, cold and drafty, earthy colors on the walls and views of a lush ravine. I worked from home and once a week I'd drive down the hill in my two-door stick shift Wrangler, pick up Jeff in front of the hotel where, likely or not, he'd be sheltering under the awning to escape the drizzle and we'd go to lunch. Our favorite was Chinatown, where we'd alternate between the stepping back in time places I'd visited with my grandfather as a child and the sleek modern hipster joints. <laughs> This day, we'd settled into seats at one of the new places tucked under the I-5 and ordered iced tea. We'd just decided on pad thai and curry when Jeff's phone rang. It's one of my guys. I got to take this, he said. As he listened, a shadow of concern crept over his face. Lock the room, he said into the phone to his engineer. Don't let anyone in. I'll be right there. And then he looked at me and said, I'm sorry, but we've got to go. There's an emergency at the hotel. What is it? I asked, but he just shook his head no and asked the waiter to bring the bill. Mm. We got into the car, I drove, and Jeff made some curt phone calls on the way. I dropped him in the alley on the side of the roamer, which was now full of police cars and fire engines, lights and sirens off. Jeff came back home from work that night, tight-lipped. Suicide, was all he'd say. Ravi found her. The woman was supposed to check out yesterday, but hadn't, so they'd set him up to disable the security chain. When I got there, my boss was trying to get past him into the room, but but he'd done what I'd asked and wouldn't let her in. She started arguing with me, saying it was her hotel, but I told her she didn't need to see what was in that room. Fire me if you want, I had said, but I'm ex-military, and trust me, <laughs> let me deal with it. I'm trying to protect you. In the end, I got my way. He sighed, closed his eyes, shook his head, and I didn't ask any more questions. Fast forward 10 years, a happy marriage, two kids, and a move to Colorado later. Jeff and I were out on a date night while grandma watched the kids. We grabbed pre-dinner beers at the Barley with its concrete floors and old ski mountain advertisements on the walls. It was spring, what we call mud season, after the mountain has closed and before the summer tourists arrive. A young bartender with long, straight, dark hair and a bee tattoo on her arm served us. We were the only ones there, and the three of us started to chat. The bartender had moved to town recently, and we got to talking about places we'd all lived. Seattle came up. Oh, I was there a few months ago, the bartender said. I went with my mom. We stayed downtown and had the best time. Oh, yeah? What hotel? Jeff asked. Oh, the Hotel Romer, she said. Mm -hmm. It was great, except I saw a ghost. That part was crazy. It wasn't just me that saw it either. I was half asleep, half awake when I saw this woman looming over me, kind of floating next to me. I called to my mom in the next bed, and she saw it too. I reached over to turn on the light, and then it was gone. Jeff took a sip of his beer. He got that look he gets when he's trying to figure something out, like if there's a leak somewhere and he's trying to trace it to the root of the problem. What floor were you on? He asked the bartender. Third, she said. Do you remember the room number? No. By the elevator? Yeah. The ghost. Asian? Woman? In her 20s? Yes, she said. You're giving me the chills. How do you know that? white nightgown exactly she said and a necklace or something around her neck she kept touching it i'm not quite sure jeff turned to me and said remember that day we went to lunch at that thai place how could i forget (laughs) and then the bartender and i both learned what happened that day a young asian woman in a white nightgown how she'd hung herself (sighs) from the rod in the closet hadn't checked out as she was scheduled to and one of jeff's engineers had gone up to the room How Jeff had taken the brunt of the situation on himself, sparing the rest of the staff as the emergency personnel and the police and then the people from the morgue and then the cleaning crew, how they all came and went. After the tale, after the tale he told us, we'd all sat, the bartender, Jeff and I, speechless. 
At the time, it had just felt like a weird coincidence how Jeff and the bartender had crossed paths and started talking at random about things that they were both tied to. But the more I think about it, the more I wonder if somehow the meeting wasn't by chance. What if people like Jeff and our bartender are somehow tied together, interconnected because of their experiences with the same thing? Or maybe it's that the woman didn't want to be forgotten and was somehow part of making this meeting happen. A strange final coda to all of this is that we live in a very, very small town. And though we don't go out a lot, most times when we do, it's to the barley. And we've mm -hmm. never, ever seen that bartender again. I hope you enjoyed the story. I can't wait to hear it if it makes it onto the show. Thanks again for all you do, Kristen. Thanks, Kristen. Bizarre, right? Yeah, very bizarre. Uh, I, li I like what she, what Kristen said about like, what if her spirit wanted to be remembered? Like wanted that connection to be made for whatever reason. What if she didn't actually die by suicide? What if somebody else was in there? What if they never figured it out? What if she's trying to pull a Bonita Sierra? What's her name? Teresita Bassa. <laughs> Teresita Bassa. Bonita Sierra. <laughs> <laughs> She knows what I mean. Yeah, totally. She gets it. I'm always bringing her up because that case yeah. mystifies me. <laughs> Teresita Bassa. <laughs> I love Bonita Sierra. It's just a random word to that. I mean, I get I get the sound kind of similarities. <sighs> it's her sister. <laughs> Pretty Sierra. <laughs> Bonita Sierra. What, what is, it's been so, I, I, is Bonita just pretty in Spanish? Uh, sure. Yeah, like muy bonita. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> I never took Spanish. I took Latin and German. Oh, Try man. again. <laughs> but weird, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like, okay. Thanks, I, Logan. I also like love that this idea that this couple went out in this very small town. Mm -hmm. They always go to the same bar. That bartender never to be seen again. That's that's weird. That is weird. I know that. that yeah, that bartender deal. I'm like, that, what is going on there? I know it sounds like she kind of alluded at the very end of that story. Like, was he real? A real bartender? But I mean. That's super strange because other people were seeing this person there too. Mm -hmm. But there were, well, were they? Because there was only Jeff oh, was, and Kristen uh, and the bartender in the bar. She says that at the very beginning, like, you know, we went in, it was just the three of us. Just, the bar was, the bar was empty for all other intents and purposes. Uh, so that, was that like another ghost sharing the tale of? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole thing. I mean, what is just what's just, what just a unique evening? Yeah, and so memorable, and just would yeah. I'm sure they're just going to be like trying to figure it out for the rest of their lives. Like, mm -hmm. what was that about? Yeah, why? Why? Like, what are the odds mm -hmm. that you and I go out tonight? We don't live in a very big town, yeah, and we go to bar A. And it's just mm -hmm. us and the bartender, which already Man. is like a little bit unusual. I know. Now I want to like find a story. What are you doing to those guys? Oh, I don't know. I just was getting excited with my hands. They happened to be in my hands. <laughs> what are they doing? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they like it rough sometimes. <laughs> there are children that watch. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Don't play rough with your toys. <laughs> but that is, I'm surprised I haven't come across that in just some like story from the web or from a book or something. Because it's always like, uh, sorry, with the bartender situation, there's like a place that's haunted and the bartender is the one sharing like, oh yeah, you was, you saw such and such in the bathroom? Uh -huh. Of course, that's been happening for years. Uh -huh. But I can't recall where the bartender themselves uh -huh. was the ghost. Where somebody goes to a bar and then, you know, like in a probably more, I don't know, the, the story, the way it's shaping up in my mind is like they would go to the bar and then later they'd be like, hey, what happened to Richie? Uh, why isn't he working here anymore? And they'd be like, who? Exactly. That is freaky. Mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. maybe it is connected all back to that hotel. Yeah. But it, it really did leave me with this thought of like, if I see something. It Say something. What? <laughs> no, we're not at the airport. <laughs> if Let's just say I saw a ghost in our studio. Yeah. And and I like didn't ever really talk about it with you. I was just like, oh, this like creepy thing happened. Mm -hmm. But like, eh, I was just kind of like brushing it off. And then 10 years from now, we're living in New Orleans and we're talking to a bartender at our local corner bar. It's a Tuesday night at six yeah. o'clock. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. one's there. It's just the three of us. And we start talking about Cordelate, like just like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would freak me the fuck out. They're like, oh, yeah, two, you know that. Oh, on this street in this mm -hmm, building, mm -hmm. I would be like, why do you know that? Yeah, you're seeing this spirit of some young woman and then they find out, yeah, years later in a different place that in that same place, like here in the studio before we leased it or whatever. Yeah. Yikes. But it, but then there was also some sort of weird comfort for me of like, okay, maybe we are all connected on the other side. 
Mm -hmm. Like maybe the spirits bring us all together in some really like beautiful kind of magical way to share their story and it connects people that are still living and I don't know. I wanted it to be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. I like today's stories. Why are you banging those guys together? What are you angry about? Not relaxed. You don't look like it. I don't. No. Mm. You look like you're up. It feels good. Just feels good. Smush them. <laughs> Is that creepy? <laughs> only, when, only when you make that face, like, ah, it feels so good. <laughs> Where am I looking? <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, weird. Oh, okay, child. <laughs> okay. Do you uh, do you want to thank some Annabelles? Sure. I would love to thank some Annabelles <laughs> for helping us to donate to the Museum of Tolerance this month. Johnny Wheels. Which Johnny is Wheels. The best name ever. I mm-hmm. just want to stop there. <laughs> I don't want to keep going. <laughs> Johnny Wheels was a race car driver. <laughs> uh, Cesar Sinfuegos, Skyler and Myrna, Caitlin Cooney, Alan and Hannah, Christy Surin, Berserk Cashew. That's a good one. Carlos Abarca, Anna Lowe Hartman, Josh Cofield, Casey Arnold, Amber Huggins, Emily Stalling, Pirate Wrecker. <laughs> I love it. Like Pirate Wrecker, Berserk Cashew, and Johnny Wheels. Yeah. They're <laughs> that's in a, that's a trio. That's a trio. That's awesome. Uh, Rachel, Gator Dodge, Broken Promise, pr- oh, Promises. Oh, they've spelled it really weird. I don't okay. understand why. Annabelle. Zach Sigmund and Stephen Castro. I will thank all of you. Thank you all. And I would also like to thank the these following Annabelles. Uh Logan. Not our Logan, I don't think. You uh, never know. You never know. Uh Will Doe 19, Jonathan Stratton, Ariel Sherman, or Ariel Sherman, Swampy Hold. <laughs> Swampy Hold. That sounds like a weird sex move. <laughs> Cody Spence. Aaron Tipping. <laughs> Jeremy Fox. What if it was supposed to be Swampy Hole? That's even worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jack Soft Ghost. Uh, the way it's spelled weird. G O A S T E. So maybe he goes. Jack Soft. Uh, Jack Soft Ghost. <laughs> ah, I'm such an idiot. He snuck it in there. Jack Soft Ghost. Uh, well done. <laughs> Teresa Katie. I could hear Logan laughing before you too. even got it. <laughs> Wesley Westcote, <laughs> Karen D, Christy Robbins, Matthew Wartena, Riley Sneed, Motown and B Town, uh, Yoli uh, Favela, Favela, Courtney Jensen, Thomas Perez, and Cora B. All right. And some spoopy shout outs. Spoops. To Ebony from Mom and Dad, happy 11th birthday to our oldest creeper. To Kaylin, a.k.a. the greatest woman alive from your fiance, Cody, happy anniversary. To Frankie from Brittany, happy birthday. To Kristen from Kelsey, happy birthday. And to Leah, my honeydew melon head <laughs> from Ron, happy 50th birthday. Oh, that is gorgeous. Uh, that's gorgeous? It's gorgeous. <laughs> what? It's, co- it's good. It's sweet. I don't know why gorgeous came out of my head. Are you okay? I am. I feel fine. <laughs> that is our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith and Tyler C. for their work on social media. And their support on Patreon. And their support on Patreon. And to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Uh, thanks to Logan, our art warlock, for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, and to book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing the listener stories for book number four. Uh, I found today's first story that I told. Thanks to Sarah Finch for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch the show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content and see the photos that accompany the episodes at Scared to Death Podcast. And we can follow us on TikTok, also at Scared to Death Podcast. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want both monthly bonus episodes, come on, dude, spit it out. Check out our Patreon and get the entire catalog ad free and so much more. And don't forget to mark your calendars. This will be the last post show and end of the show long announcement I'll do for this. Tickets are live for summer camp as this episode releases this past Monday, January 16th, noon Pacific time. Tickets released for the 2023 Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp, but only for OG campers from last year. Those campers sent a link via email. And the link posted in the Wet Hot Facebook group. Great. Tickets all also open up for all of our Bad Magic patrons this Wednesday, January 18th at noon Pacific time. Correct. Check, check your Patreon posts. 
Then this Friday, January 20th, noon Pacific time, tickets open for everyone. Everyone! You just go to badmagicmerch.com and look for the banner at the top of the page. After this week, we'll also post a link on our socials and in future episode descriptions. Ticketing stays open for everyone until camp sells out. Limited tickets available. Once the cabins are filled up, that is it. And that is uh, it for this episode. Thank God. Enjoy your nightmares. We had a lot to say. We did. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. See you at camp. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. Sometimes they do it like this, uh-huh. and then sometimes they get real creative and they go like this. <laughs> <laughs> what's that? What's that position called? Um, rub a dub. I guess it'd be more like, like this. <laughs> Sixty nine, but but not, but like twisted. I don't even know what it is. I don't know what position that would be. You know, they have their own anatomy. They can do things that we can't. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for mm-hmm. that uh, that little lesson. Yeah. <laughs> You're such a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs>